Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of this introduction of Mask Tools for Blender. And in this part we're going to be focusing primarily on using the add-on for texture painting. And even if you don't have any interest in using Mask Tools, you should stick around because there's going to be a lot of tips on how to use some of Blender's more hidden functionality in its texture painting settings. I won't be covering all of them, of course, but just a handful of the ones that I find most useful. If you missed the first part where I demonstrated how to get started with Mask Tools, then I'll leave a link below this video so that you can check it out. Now in this scene I have this hallway, and all of the objects in this scene were textured with Mask Tools using their procedural nodes. But I would like to add some more visual interest to the wall and the floor. So this will be our canvas for texture painting. If I select the wall, you can see that I have the textures for that wall plugged into the mask base node. And now I can drag a second set of PBR textures into the shader editor and plug them into their inputs. And I'm using this uh, set of uh, concrete textures, so I'm using the color, the roughness, and the normal maps. Okay, so now I need to create a new texture to paint on and that will be plugged into the mask input. So I'll just call this one concrete and leave the texture as black, of course. And that goes into the mask input and then I'll go to my texture paint workspace. Now, when you download the add-on, you'll notice that it comes with a folder of textures. Many of these are actually texture brushes designed for texture painting specifically. Some of them stencils, some of them just detail brushes. And the detail brushes generally come in two types, the hard and the soft version. So I'm going to use a soft detail brush. This has more blurred edges. Okay, so before getting started painting, you'll need to make sure that everything is set up properly. First, make sure that you've selected the texture that you're painting on. And then under the texture drop box, make sure that the brush that you've selected is active. And under the falloff options, I'm going to select this last falloff. This just uses the full color space of the brush without any gradients. And now under the mapping for this texture, I'm going to switch this from tiled to viewplane. And once I do that, I can see that there's this new checkbox that says random. And this will randomly rotate the texture while you're painting. But let's turn that off so that we can demonstrate what the texture looks like without it. So if I paint this across the surface, well, there's two things wrong actually. First of all, we only want to use the light values of that brush. So instead of mix, we're going to set the blend type to add, and that will ignore all of that dark value. So if we paint across now, we can see that it's just adding the white value, but it just doesn't look very good. The texture is just repeating. If we click the random checkbox, we get a much better result. And if you're using a tablet, you have even more options because you have these pen pressure tabs here to affect the, the strength and the radius. So with the radius selected, I can use the pressure of my pen to increase or decrease the size. Let's just control Z to undo that. And then if I uncheck radius and check strength, now I can, depending on my pressure, adjust the strength of that value. And because I am using a tablet, I'm just going to select both of those options. And now I only want to paint on the wall, so I'm going to select this face masking tab and then, then select the wall itself so that I don't accidentally paint on the ceiling. And I'll turn my overlays off so that I can see the texture painting effect in the viewport. And now I can just start blending these two sets of PBR textures together. And I do like that stone texture in the background, so I want to make sure that it stays visible for the most part, but I I also want to get a good representation of the concrete as well. And it doesn't matter that these objects are in the scene. Once you're painting, you'll still paint behind them, uh, provided that they're not part of the same mesh. I think that causes issues, but uh, separate objects won't block your, uh, your texture brush from applying that color. Now I'll add a bump node in because I want to make that concrete look like it's uh, raised up a little further than, than the stone texture. And by default, that's going to be very high, so I'll just take the strength down. Okay, it's starting to look pretty good. Maybe a little more shadow detail there. <clears throat> 
And although I said that this was going to be mostly focused on texture painting, I would like to add a procedural effect here. Uh, so I'm going to box select this mask base node, move it over, and then duplicate it and drop it into the line. Now I'll connect those outputs to the corresponding inputs on the new mask base. And I'll add this yellow paint texture. And I'm going to be doing this a little differently than, than I would normally. Uh, instead of adding the roughness and normal maps for that yellow paint texture, I'm going to borrow the roughness and normal information from the, the first mask base node. So it's going to use the roughness and the normal maps of the concrete and stone textures. Okay, so now I'll type N to bring up my sidebar where the mask tools are located, and I'll select this lines mask. Okay, so now I'll plug this into the mask input, and by default, the lines mask applies three lines on each of the three axes. And these might be represented a little differently than you might think. The Z, for instance, is not this up and down line, it's the horizontal line that can move up and down in that Z axis. So I'm going to turn the X and the Y lines off, leaving only the, the Z remaining. So I don't really like the position of this line or the thickness, so there's a few ways that we can correct this. Uh, we have these plus and minus sliders that can either increase the height, or we can actually use the uh, negative to pull it down. And in this case, you could make a gradient, which is really helpful in, in many cases. Uh, but if I click on the plus and drag down to the minus, I can actually move both of these at once, which allows me to position the line wherever I choose. So right about here is okay. And then maybe I'll take the negative value down to make it a little thicker. Okay, so now I'm going to jump back into more texture painting settings. As I said in the beginning, all of the objects in the scene were textured with mask tools. Uh, and then those textures were baked so that they can be used in Eevee. So if we want to add more effects now to, say, these oil drums, uh, we need to add a new mask base node and then reapply those textures to that instead of going directly into the principal shader. So now we have those textures plugged into the first set of PBR textures on the mask base, and we can continue by adding a second set of textures. So I'll just use that same uh, yellow paint texture from before, but this time I am, of course, using the roughness and the normal maps. And for the mask, I'll create a new texture and then click New, call it Flammable, because I'll be using the Flammable stencil from the... Uh, the texture folder that the add-on comes with. And I'll just go ahead and plug in all of my color roughness and normal information into the principled shader before painting. So if I navigate to the folder and find that flammable stencil, and then I go to my texture paint settings, make sure that I'm painting on the right texture, that my strength is all the way up, and I'm going to switch from view plane to stencil. And when you do that, your stencil appears in the viewport whenever you drag the brush into the viewport. So you can move it just by right-clicking on it and dragging it. And if you hold Shift and use the right-click on the mouse, you can scale it. And once you've positioned it where you want, you simply just paint over the stencil and you've applied that new set of PBR textures. And we have these options on the mask base to blend this. So I'm just going to blend it in a little with the texture underneath to make it look a little faded. And I think that looks pretty good. Now there's a few more things that we can do with stencil brushes. So I'm going to change my stencil to this leaking texture. And what I want to do is make it appear underneath of these metal electrical boxes. So if I hold shift and I tap X while I drag in the mouse, I can actually scale this on the X axis. Now I'll just paint over it. And this is a really good example of how being able to scale these stencils on an axis can be really helpful because there are a lot of textures that would not be able to be used otherwise. But you can scale this on the X and the Y and you can also rotate it by holding 
control and then using the right mouse button. And while Mask Tools comes with a selection of stencils and other textures, you can really easily make your own masks in photo editing software like GIMP, for instance, to just continue to expand your library. And just keep in mind whenever you're creating a mask that the black will represent the first set of PBR textures and the white will always represent the second set of PBR textures on any of the mask nodes, whether you're using the mask base or paint mask nodes. Now I'll demonstrate another way to add some detail to your models. I'll create a new texture and I'll call it Crex. And I'll plug it into the mask input. But rather than plug textures into the second set of inputs, I'm just going to change the color to black. And I'll go back to my texture folder and grab one of these Crack textures. And we're not going to use a stencil this time. You could use a stencil, but there's a much better way of adding this kind of detail to your models. So under the texture type, we'll switch from stencil back to view plane. And then under the stroke, we're going to switch it from space to anchored. And what anchored does is it basically turns your brush into a stamp. If you left click and drag out or rotate your mouse, you can scale and rotate the stamp. And then once you unclick, then it will apply that stamp. And you can see the texture uh, being rotated and scaled within that brush before you actually apply it, which is helpful. So I'll just add a few cracks in this corner. And then maybe one on the side as well. And I can use the blending options on the mask base node to make that maybe not so dark. But I can emphasize that effect by adding a bump node. And while these details seem rather small, they actually make a pretty big difference when you're doing, say, uh, environments or you know designing objects for video games or whatever. They, uh, they really make a big difference when you add these tiny details. Now I'm going to use a paint mask node to paint some details on this floor. So I already have two sets of PBR textures plugged into the paint mask. So I need to create a new texture for the mask. And I'll just call this one floor dirt. And I'll plug it into the paint mask input. And you may remember from the last video, there are a few settings that need to be changed. For instance, I'm going to switch the stroke type back to space and then choose this fourth falloff that has a really strong gradient. And now I'll delete that texture so I'm just painting a value of white. And what I want to do is paint around the base of some of these objects where dirt might accumulate. So I'll just paint a little around these drums. Then I'll open up my shader editor and look at some of these options on the paint mask node. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the edge slider. So what this does is it adds a thin black line around that texture. And you can scale that edge as well. What this does is just create some contrast between those two texture types. And now I can use the scale, distort, and refine values to get the right shape of that effect. I can also add some bump so that we get some of that lighting and shadow detail while we're painting. So I'm just trying to get this effect of, again, this debris that's collected around the base of these objects. And now I can just start painting around some of these other objects and maybe up here against the wall. This is a really fun way of adding some detail because uh, it just gives you that option of continuing to edit those effects even after you've painted. And of course, because they're value sliders, you know, if you had a case where you wanted to animate this effect, you could. And generally, when I'm texture painting with mask tools, I like to set up all of my mask base nodes with all of the, the textures applied. And that way I can just stay in the texture paint workspace, switch between the textures, and just layer on all of these details. And again, if you don't understand the workflow of mask tools, then watch that first video because it, it demonstrates how 
uh, mask tools is used. It's just a really quick and, and easy way of applying these complex layers of textures. Here's one more tip for texture painting. Uh, here I have this texture that I created of tire tracks and I want to deselect the random box and instead select this box that says rake. And what the rake option does is it will rotate the texture depending on what angle you're painting at. In other words, whatever direction your brush is moving, the texture itself will rotate to that position. And this doesn't always give the best results. There are a few ways of correcting it. Like we can change the spacing, for instance, uh, to get maybe a smoother result. Um, generally, you'll get a good result with things that aren't uh, meant to be connected. Uh, so something like footsteps would work great. Uh, but in this case, since I'm trying to connect this tire track texture, um, it's, it's not always going to give the best results. But with things like uh, stitching, you know, like thread, and, uh, and again, footsteps, and things like that, it works really very well. And just like I did before with the crack detail, I can blend this so that it looks not so dark. And I can also add the bump detail to it. Now, it doesn't appear that the bump detail is coming out very well because the normal strength is a bit high. So you have the ability to lower the normal strength of any area that's being masked. So I'm just lowering the normal strength of the tire tracks, for instance, which will help that bump detail show up a little better. So many things can be done with mask tools. Here I'm painting out a wet map to create these puddles. But you can paint different materials on your models, you can mix textures. It's just a really good and effective way of painting. And I hope that it only gets better in the future with, uh, with new additions to the add-on. If you're interested in mask tools, I'll leave a link in the description below. Thanks for watching.